I am so sick and tired of being so sick and tired. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if it's just not one thing, it's another. Or as I've heard said, and I do believe it with all my heart, if it's not one thing, it's my mother. Oh, for crying out loud. I mean, it's just everything is going on at the same time. All my four boys need help with their homework or someone needs to be going here or going there and only the mom can do it, praise the Lord. And can you make me something to eat, mom? And can you, where's that clothing piece that I need, mom? And and then the baby comes up, you know, he's 10 years old, but he comes up out of the basement. He says, mama, the basement is flooded again. And I said, oh my goodness, it is the middle of winter. What are you talking about? How can the basement be flooded? I mean, when all that snow melts, we get the basement flooded. And um, we take that old shop back out and you know, there goes my husband and we're just taking the towels and we're putting that down. We go through all that process. But how in the middle of the winter, I am telling you that we can have water in that basement. Well, sure enough, the sewer is backed up and the toilet downstairs is plugged and there's water everywhere and it's stinking water and I have just about had it, praise the Lord. And so we have to go and get that shop back and call some people for help. and. You know, I just, wow, I just think, really, God, is, is this really, I mean, it just seems a little too much, and, and it just gets a little bit too much, and I know he says that he has peace to give. He does tell us in his word, John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you, and my peace I give you, and I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Well, I am a little bit troubled with all that water, especially when it's stinky in my basement. So you know what, though? I'm gonna sing myself a song, and it just usually calms me right down, and, and it's a song by Annie Oakley, and uh, here it goes. Oh, there's cooking and cleaning and laundry galore, and the basement has flooded again. And I'm just about crazy, so I cry out no more. What I need is my greatest friend. But life's not so tricky. If I was not so picky, I'd give Jesus Christ a nod. Trying to do it my way, I only fall and then pay. Yes, there's only real peace with our God. The time spent with Jesus is what we need to free us from the cares, burdens, and the frauds. But if I start to hurry, I frankly start to worry. Yes, there's only real peace with our God, with our God, with our God. Yes, there's only real peace with our God. If I do it my way, with hope and trust, I must pray to have peace in my whole day through. But if I only hurry, my life's only a flurry. Yes, there's only one way in the day not to stray. Yes, there's only real peace with our God. I'm cool, brave, and daring in each day that I'm sharing when I'm praising Jesus God's Son. But when evil's a lurking, that's when I'm a hurting. Yes, there's only real peace with our God. When I give forgiveness, my life has peace and real bliss in the rain or the blazing sun. But if I'm only bitter, I'm just a lonely quitter. Yes, there's only real peace with our God, with our God, with our God. Yes, there's only real peace with our God. God is our protector. Please let me give this lecture. He's the one who will always care. So there's no use of trying. You'll only end up crying. Yes, there won't be real rest with freedom to be blessed. Yes, there's only real peace with our God. Yee-ha! I'm Debbie Griffith, and I love to encourage people. This Debbie Griffith wanted to be a Broadway star, and that was my dream. But I am not a Broadway star. I get to be on stages and I get to share characters and use my props to communicate the message of God's love and God's goodness. And I'm so thankful. So I would say that God did not deny my dream. He redirected it. 
we so often hear, just follow your dreams. If you believe, you can achieve. And I would say, believe in God. Trust in who He says you are. Find your identity in Him, and He will show you the best way to walk. I love Proverbs 16, 9, because it really says what I'm trying to communicate, that we make our plans, but the Lord directs our steps. And it's so true. There is joy. There is purpose in this life now. And Jesus came, came as God, fully God, fully man, but he came to redeem us because we are born into sin and we have not a perfect self, but we have the hope of eternity because he came. And I would love to just have you understand more than anything that Jesus did not die on the cross so we could have a religion. He died on the cross so we could have a real personal and intimate relationship with him. A lot of people have been hurt by other Christians or the church. But again, knowing Jesus, when you really know him and know that he loves you and he's not mad at you. Of course, he's disappointed over some of our choices because he knows those choices will bring us harm or hurt. But he loves us. And that is the good news, the good news of the gospel, that he has sufficient grace for everything we walk through and go through. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you. And that's a present tense verb, right now sufficient for you. There are days I wake up and I don't want to continue going, meaning I want to stay in bed. And I would cry out to God and I would lament, which is fine and good, and he hears every cry. I would say a scripture verse. But it's not like he's a genie in a Bible and you say the verse and, okay, now I feel better. It's trusting what he says. So I look at a verse like Zephaniah 317, and it says, The Lord your God is living among you. He's a mighty Savior. He takes delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears, and he rejoices over you with joyful song. Now, again, if I just said that verse out loud, there is power in his word because his word does not return to him empty, but it accomplishes everything he purposes it to do. And we know that from Isaiah 55, 11. But what it is for me is believing that he delights in me, that his love will comfort me in all things. So I am now choosing to say out loud what I hear him saying. It's my voice, but his truth. Debbie, I love you so much. I cover you in love. I dance around you. I sing joyful songs over you. You are my child. I walk with you in everything you go through. I'm not surprised at what you're going through. Everything that happens to you has to go through God first. And he always has a plan of redemption, a plan for hope as you step forward with the sufficient grace. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God promises that there is no temptation or trial which is not common to someone else. And he is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But every time that you are tempted, he will provide a way out so you can stand up under it. He will give you that grace. Now the phrase, God doesn't give you more than you can handle, that is not in the Bible. Because there's a lot going to come at you. God will give you the grace to handle it. Okay, so here I am in the airport once again with my two red suitcases filled with costumes, which I call outfits, costumes, I'm a theater major, and all my props because I'm not a PowerPoint girl, I'm a props girl to illustrate points. And so I'm hauling these two big red suitcases and I have my laptop and that's kind of a side bag and I have a crossbody purse and then I have this book bag and I just think I'm all that because I can manage it all. and. I take the flight from International Falls to Minneapolis. I was going to Nashville and I get the luggage. It comes the two big red suitcases and I'm just nifty, nifty. And I just go right down the escalator, no problem. I take the two suitcases, have you know the purse, the book bag, and the laptop, and these two red suitcases, and I managed on the escalator. How cool is that? And I get the paperwork for the rent a car, and now I'm gonna have to go outside and go down the cement sidewalk thing and get my rent a car. 
Well, I see this man, this very jovial, large black man in this golf cart like thing. And he says to me, hey ma'am, you want a ride? You look like you need a ride. And I said, nope. No, I'm good, you know, uh, yeah, you, you know, I'm from Minnesota, I'm Minnesota, you betcha, we're just, we're all good, I'm a strong Minnesota girl. And uh, he's like, well, ma'am, you sure? So he asked me one time, and I, you know, I was just fine, I had this whole system down, I'm doing that, and he's coming up alongside of me eventually, and he asked me another time, he said, ma'am, I just think you, I just think that you need, and I, with my strong Minnesota, Scandinavian hoo-ha pride. I'm like, no, no, I, yeah, you were on Minnesota. We just do it. We're fine. I'm fine, you know. And and he he uh, Kenny, I found out his name was. He just thought, no, I needed help. I again, no. I get to the escalator to go up, and uh, Kenny says, ma'am, I just I think I would take the the elevator. I'd take the elevator and go that way. And I said, no, I did the escalator. So I take my two red suitcases with all the stuff hanging on me, and yeah, you guessed it. I, it was all kitty wampus, and the next thing you know, I'm falling backwards on the escalator, and I knew to let my suitcases just go, and there I see Kenny bounding up to rescue me, and he is just right there, and I fell like three stairs. I just got a little bruise and I let the suitcases go. He just pushes the suitcase and he's, you know, he's just huffing and puffing. He's like, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. You, oh, what, oh. And he's just so nervous and he, you know, just kind of lifts me up and he, we go down on the escalator and he takes my suitcases and that's it. That's it for Kenny. I mean, we are not messing around now. He is, but he's just huffing and puffing. And, and I'm just kind of in that kind of starlet, you know, like what just happened and I'm okay. And, and he says to me, you know what? I, I am so sorry. Ah, and, I, and I just kept saying, Kenny, you are right. I should have taken, I should have not been so stubborn. I, I can be so stubborn. I am so sorry. And he's just like so nervous. And it reminded me of like in the Wizard of Oz, you know, before the cowardly lion, Zeke, played by Burt Lair before he is the Cowardly Lion and Dorothy is trying to balance and she falls into the pig pen and and Zeke um, is just you know sitting down and they realize oh he's more nervous than she was that's what Kenny was like because he said you just about done give me a heart attack girl you just about didn't give me a heart and I said I am so sorry Kenny I wish you would listen to me and then he says this most amazing thing just about an hour before that I had gotten a text, or right when I had gotten off the airplane, and it was a text of just a scripture verse from Exodus uh, 23, 20. I am praying that an angel goes ahead of you and prepares the way that God has set for you, okay? When Kenny is just going on and on about, ah, you just about don't give me a heart attack, you should listen to me, and then he says this, I, I was just that angel sent to protect you. I couldn't even believe it. I said, what'd you say, Kenny? And so then he tells me this, goes on and tells me the story about, you know, it's just like that person that's, that they're having a flood and, and they say, God's gonna save me, God's gonna save me. And, and a boat comes by and that person says, no, God's gonna save me. And the boat goes on and, and the water rises again to the, the, and so the person has to go to the second story and another boat comes by and says, no, I don't need no help. I'm gonna, God's gonna save me, God's gonna save me, God's gonna save me. And sure enough, the man ends up on top of the, the roof, Kenny's telling me, and the man is saying, God's gonna save me, and a helicopter comes by and puts down a ladder and says, come on, come on. No, God's gonna save me, God's gonna save me. Well, the man went under, underwater, the flood took him, he gets to heaven, Kenny's telling me the story, and the man says, God, where were you? Why didn't you save me? And God said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. And Kenny tells me the story, and I said, Kenny, you're right, but I was just so marveling at it all. You know what, we all can be so, get so stubborn, and so I can do it, I can do it. When God's saying, here, you don't know, I'm, I'm working through Kenny at the airport. My friend who sent me the scripture said, I'm not gonna be surprised if you go back to the airport and you never find a man named Kenny. And I just, wow, God is so amazing. His word is so amazing and it's so neat to see how his word 
This everyday real living word applied to our everyday circumstances, our everyday matters. Sometimes the problem is we take on more than we should handle. We worry about more than, than we need to. We take on somebody else's load and problem that we are not called to carry. So I really want to encourage you to know that he is there and he understands how hard it is. What helps me is in the morning when I get up and I'm feeling discouraged or frustrated or anxious and I don't want to get up. I want to stay under the covers. And sometimes I've done that. And then I'll say a verse thinking like God is a genie in a Bible. And if I say the verse, I'll get better. Now there's truth to saying a scripture and saying it out loud, knowing from Isaiah 55, 11, that God's word does not return void, but accomplishes everything he purposes it to do. But if I just say the verse and I don't really understand or trust the promise behind it, it's not going to take effect. So for example, Zephaniah 317 says this, the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He takes delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. Now I can say that and that is good, but what's more important is that I believe it and I trust it and I look at what the verse is saying, what God is saying to me, that he takes delight in me. His love will comfort me in all the fear that I have, anxiety that I have. He's rejoicing over me with song. He is a mighty savior. He is a redeemer. So one thing that I've recently started doing is I will say out loud what I hear God's voice saying to me. I love you so much, Debbie. I delight in you. I understand you and care about everything you're going through. Nothing's too little or too big for me. I am God and I love you. And throughout the day, I might say, I love you, Debbie, which is God's voice to me. And it's so encouraging and so comforting. So I want to encourage you to do that same thing. Throughout your day, whoever you are, whatever your name is, Brenda, John, Barb, Carol, Susan, Diane, say out loud, God loves me. God loves Diane. God loves Brian. He rejoices over me. He delights in me. I'm a woman of no distinction, of little importance, a woman of no reputation, say that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast judgmental glances, though you don't take the time to really look at me or even get to know me, for to be known is to be loved and to be loved is to be known, and otherwise what's the point of doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look at my face and not just see two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears, but to see all that I am and could be, all my hopes, my loves, my fears, my dreams. But that's too much to wish for, to hope for, to pray for, so I don't. Not anymore. Now I keep to myself, and by that I mean the pain. The pain of my own private jail. The pain that brought me here at midday to this well. To ask of a drink is no big request. But to ask it of me, a woman unclean, shamed, used, and abused, an outcast, a disappointment, a sinner? No drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning as I'm sure you condemn me now. But you don't. You're a man of no distinction, but of the utmost importance, a man of no reputation, at least so far. You whisper and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about, and you take the time to really look at me, but don't need to get to know me, for to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known, and you know me, you actually know me. All of me, everything about me, every thought inside, every hair on top of my head, every hurt stored up, every hope, every dread for my past, my future, all that I am and could be, you tell me everything you tell me about me. And that which is spoken by another would only bring hate and condemnation, but coming from you brings love, grace, hope, peace, and salvation. Oh, I've heard of one to come who would save a wretch like me, and now here in my presence you say that I am he. To be loved is to be known, and to be known is to be loved. I've just met you, but I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to you. Let me run back to town. This is way too much for just me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good and the bad, sinners and saints, who should hear what you've told me, see what you've shown me, taste what you gave me, feel how you forgave me. For to be loved is to be known, and to be known is to be loved. And they all need this too. We all do need it for our own. God's word is God himself. The book, the Bible, is not about us. It's about God as a redeemer, as a restorer, 
I like to say what my friend Chad Bird says. He's not a life coach. He is God. He is all-powerful. Nothing's too big or too small for him. And he's not surprised by anything that happens. I think sometimes we get in this place where we think God is mad at us. And he's angry. God loves us. And he might be disappointed, of course, over choices we make, over our sin. But he has a way out for us. He has a way that he will show us that he can work it for the good. Like Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work for the good to those who love God, and he's called for a purpose. So it's so encouraging to me to know that whatever mistakes I've made, I'm not a mistake because of them. And God can use them to bless me and teach me more of his grace and more of his love. In Ephesians 2, we have such good truth. Starting in verse 7, it says, In order that in the coming ages God might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not because of what we've done or ourselves or greater self-effort. It's the gift of God. Verse 9, not by our work so that we can be prideful and boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. Now, the good works aren't ways to earn more of his love. We cannot earn his love. It's by grace. So why does he create these good works for us to do? He does that because it's by the purpose he gives us that we are fulfilled. Not in reach, but outreach. Not just taking care of self and what happens to us and our happiness and what we think we deserve is by coming alongside of others in a purposeful way. And there's so many different occupations. We're all in ministry as believers in Christ because ministry is simply ministering to the person that God sits in front of you. So Mother Teresa, when she was asked, how do you serve so many people? How are you able to do this? Her reply was, I simply serve the person that God puts in front of me. Now, that can be really challenging in everyday life, especially with family. I think family is the hardest ministry. Marriages, parenting, extended family, that can be really a hard ministry. It's sometimes, I think, a lot easier to go abroad on a missions trip and share God and then come back. And then, oh, now we're in the trenches again of everyday life ministry. But that's where God teaches us the most. And it's through the trials and through the testing of our faith where we really grow. No one that I know in a trial says, I'm so thankful for that. But in James 1, verses 2 through 4, it says to rejoice in our trial because the testing of our faith will bring about good things and that we will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I can look back at hard places in my life and know that's true but in the middle of the trial is very difficult to thank him for it. But even in those times, to be obedient to what God has called me to do, I have received blessings and I can see them a lot sooner and quicker. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all things, for that is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. When I hit a deer, I didn't think that was necessarily a good thing. The airbag went off. It was a major accident. But clearly, I saw God's blessings almost within five to ten minutes after it happened. My scoliosis back surgery in 2003 was very hard, but it was one of the most growing times in my spirit, in my life, in my marriage with my small children that God was beginning to really teach me. And it was shortly after that he gave me the radio ministry of Everyday Matters and now I have this short feature on hundreds of stations on the Moody Bible Network, but that doesn't mean I'm all that in a bag of chips. It just means that God had used so many of those trials and times to teach me and use that time so I could encourage others and be in ministry. So that is what is hard to grasp sometimes is that we think we have to be within an organization that does ministry but ministry is loving those and coming alongside of someone and being transparent and sharing your heart and your hard places and how God met you where you were at or how you were angry with God and you didn't understand it. 
And that's okay because more people are helped by you being transparent and honest than they are with you sharing how well you're doing life and how great everything is. One evening when the four boys were sleeping and Dan was out of town in Minneapolis doing some business and I was at home on the green checkered couch. Now, if you know anything about me, you must know that I have four boys and I'm married to my husband, Dan. It's been 20 years, be 21 in year 2012. Well, we also have the green checkered couch. That green checkered couch has had everything on it. Tears, laughter, joy, Christmas, Easter, anxiety, the news of the cancer, um, all of it, that couch. I just, I'm telling you, when I get to a place where I'm in more and more arenas, I'm gonna bring that couch as a prop because that couch, that has a history. Anyway, I was on the green checkered couch and I get a call from my husband in the evening, the boys are sleeping, and he just says this, uh, Deb, I just gotta tell you that uh, I felt a hard lump thing that shouldn't be there, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, hard lump shouldn't be there. What kind of sensation goes through a person's body? I'll tell you. What goes through a person's body is this feeling of anxiety and fear, and it just starts like in your shoulders and it goes through your whole entire body. And then you get that nauseous feeling in your stomach that you might just throw up because you just heard this kind of news. However, because I had been leaning on John 14:27. Peace I leave with you, peace I give you. I knew that God had peace to give no matter what the circumstances are. If you continue that verse, it says, I don't give to you as the world gives. How does the world give peace? When we have enough money in our checkbook, we're completely healthy, our house is clean, and our kids are well behaved. God says, I have peace even when that's not the case. So then he says, our responsibility is not to be troubled or afraid because he's there and he understands. And it had to pass through him first. And he's not surprised that I'm getting this news. Hard lump shouldn't be there. So just as quickly as that nauseous anxiety, fear came in, it also just left and released. And I was like, whatever happens, I trust him. I love him. He loves me. So I said, okay. And I was able to sleep that night. I was substitute teaching the next day. Went to school, made an appointment as soon as I could. Monday, Dan came home on Saturday night. On Monday, we went to the little International Falls, whoever we could get into doctor. They said, okay, we need to do an ultrasound. We went to our little hospital in International Falls. And as we were waiting for the results of the ultrasound on that Tuesday, I sat on our bed and I just knew, knew from God where he said, Debbie, Dan's gonna have cancer. And I just said, all I said simply was, oh, I really don't need any new material. I'm all good here. And he said, I'm gonna bring you through it. And I didn't know what that meant, through it as in, he's gonna be cancer free later, or what do you mean? But all I knew was he was gonna be there, he loved me, and I trusted him. And the previous year in 2009, I called that the year of the wilderness. That was with anxiety, depression. So this is the year of the cancer. And he told me Wednesday, or so that Tuesday we get the results. They said, so not good. Duluth would be the closest big hospital, Duluth, Minnesota. So we went to Duluth on Wednesday. They got us in with a urologist. And it's like in the evening, 4.35 p.m. The doctor, because of course I came in on a first name basis, Eric, I have no idea what the last name is to be honest, and he leaves the room after Dan has taken all these tests and we have the x-rays and he comes back, he says, oh, your surgery is scheduled um, for 8 a.m. Thursday, tomorrow. Okay then, all right. He said, it, it just doesn't look, it's something's really wrong there. And it was a huge tumor it was testicular cancer. And, oh, I forgot to mention in this little story of the cancer that the week previous, we had insurance and Dan felt that with the boys and myself being so healthy and him being healthy and just the financial place that we were in that we were going to drop our insurance. Mm-hmm, that's what I'm saying. 
So he had dropped our insurance the week before, hard lump that shouldn't be there news on the green checkered couch. And so when Dr. Eric, or whatever Eric's last name is, said your surgery's tomorrow, it doesn't look good, and we find out that it's a large tumor, but it was stage one, it's still not so fun when you don't have health insurance, right? God is God. He parted the Red Sea. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We were reinstated on our insurance. When I was calling the different women and, and, and guys that were calling me, and they were checking in and processing and how backed up we were and what we'd have to pay to get back on and you know if that's even possible. And this one woman said to me, everywhere I go in every department, every desk, it's like the Griffith, the Griffiths, the Griffiths, we need to handle this. And they reinstated us. I know, right? God is so amazing. Not only that, the, the funny thing really is that a week previous, I was sitting in bed with Dan Maybe it was two weeks previous, but it was really close to when we found out this news. And I just said to my cute husband, I am so glad, Dan. I mean, it's just a little thing, but I'm just so glad you have your hair. I just, I just, I just like it that you haven't lost your hair. And then, I'm, and then he's going through chemo. But here's how cool God is too. I mean, he just, just delights in us. He just loves us so much. Dan never lost his hair through chemo. It, it's crazy. And um, he was just had a check. He's cancer free. We got reinstated with insurance. I mean, it was just amazing. Not that there weren't hard times. Not that, you know, there was, but it was just wow to see God work, to see the prayer, the, the support, the, the love. Wow. Wow, God, you're amazing. And I just think of that verse then again of John 14, 27, where God says, peace I leave, peace I give. You gonna take it? And we took the peace and we walked in peace and we walked in hope and we walked in faith and we saw God who is always real, always there, and has never left us and never will. You've probably been a participant in repeating back when a pastor or speaker begins with, God is good, and you respond, all the time. And then the pastor or speaker will say, all the time, and we respond, God is good. He is. Not everything that happens to us is good. People are not always good to us. And life is hard. But when you know God in a personal relationship, you know that He is good. His character is good. And He promises that all things, not some or most things, but all things work together for the good to those who love Him. And He is called for a purpose. When we recognize this, there is nothing that happens to us, nothing that we experience that is so awful or horrid that God can't use it. God is a redeemer. I have come to understand this kind of truth. Now, I don't always feel it. My feelings can be all over the place. But more and more as I grow in Christ and I abide in Him as He calls us to do, that He is the branch and we are the vine, and when we stay connected to Him, we yield fruit. And we know that that fruit that we hear about in Galatians is so good, so delicious. It is love, it is joy, it's peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I've always liked how in Galatians, when it's listing the nine fruits, so like the bookends of the fruits of the Spirit, love and self-control. So as I was saying, life is hard, but God is good, and He is all the time. And so no matter what you've done in the past or what's been done to you, there is always hope. And the goodness of God also ensures that this planet Earth is not our final destination. So there's something to look forward to. And that's really the definition of hope, the belief that things will get better, not just here on Earth, but into eternity, we have the hope of perfection, of perfectly restored bodies, of purpose that He intended from the very beginning. We're still doing something in heaven that is purposeful. Otherwise, why would anyone want to go there? I love that this phrase from an Australian speaker that I heard, and maybe I'm not going to do my correct accent with her, but she said, we have this depiction of heaven, right? That, that it's just this boring place, perhaps like we're sitting on a cloud playing a harp. That would be hell. 
And I always just laugh at that, thinking, yeah, I think a lot of people think that heaven is just where we float around, we're angels, well, we're not angels, we're created in God's image, we're resurrected just as Jesus was, and we have purpose. So we're not playing an instrument. Well, we might, but that's not our sole purpose, is to float around as angels, because like I said, we're not angels, and play an instrument, and then what, pass each other's instrument to each other and say, yeah, I'm done with the flute, how about you try the trumpet? So there is that hope of eternity, and that keeps me going through hard places. But also, I would say the one thing that I've really learned in the past few years is that there is redemption in all things, that nothing is wasted with God. And we make mistakes, but that doesn't mean we are a mistake. And there's things that have been done to us that are very awful. And it may be from a person that we trusted, we cared about, and they can't even understand the responsibility in that hurt. So we may never hear an apology. And that's really, really tough stuff. But God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, enables us to forgive even when there's not an apology and to move forward in freedom because unforgiveness or bitterness, hatred towards somebody else is like you drinking the poison and then waiting for the other person to die. So that's really important to know that the forgiveness and grace that God gives you, he also enables you to give that grace and forgiveness to somebody else who has hurt you. And you can't do it on your own. I mean, greater self-effort, really determining, really reading the Bible, going to church and Bible studies, that is not something that's going to enable you to give forgiveness that's not even warranted to maybe that person. Reading the Bible, going to Bible studies, and all of those things are good things that can strengthen you. But the only power you have to forgive someone who's very much hurt you is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The thing that I just just hope to do more than anything is just to live my life as Jesus did. You know, when I had uh, scoliosis back surgery as an adult and how difficult it was for me growing up, um, I mean, I had a good growing up, but I just was always the skinny, over skinny girl. And I always said that the only curve I had was the curve of my spine. And that's why I went into theater because I enjoyed being somebody else. Thankfully, I met Jesus early on. So that relationship with him grew and grew. And I still enjoy the theater. And he still loves that I enjoy the theater. I love that I can wear fun costumes when I speak. That's what I call them, costumes. I love to self-decorate. And he loves that I love to do that. There was a time that my husband and I had to put me, Debbie, on an allowance for my self-decoration for my costumes. And I remember one time we were at the Mall of America and I came with all these bags and he said, oh, Debbie, did you use all your allowance? That was it for the month. And I said, I know, but look, look at this dress. I mean, and he said, Debbie, when that happens, you're supposed to say, get thee behind me, Satan. And I said, Dan, I did, but he said, you know, it looks even better from back here than it did in the mirror. Uh, <laughs> so much of my enjoyment with the shopping was putting outfits together and some I wouldn't even wear. I just wouldn't have an occasion to wear them or whatever. I could then return some of these packages. As one of my stories is, the story of calling J. Crew catalog. I was sitting on the green checker couch in my pajamas, calling first the phone number for the catalog, which they then transfer you to the financial institution that holds their car. And I got on the phone with a man named Grant, and he told me that it would be, you know, two to four weeks and I would get a refund check. And I got off the phone and I was so impressed to pray for this man. And then God said to me on the couch, Debbie, I want you to call Grant back and tell him something. What do you mean call him back? Am I supposed to ask for him specifically or are you just going to have him appear on the phone? Or And I'm trying to figure out God now. You know I have to go through the catalog company and then they transfer me to another phone number. Like, what are you talking about? And I punched in the number and of course they said we'll have to transfer you to the financial institution and they did. And then I was on hold, not like the other time. But I just didn't have this release to let go and I just thought this was so crazy. What was I doing? What was I even supposed to tell him? God hadn't even told me that part yet. The woman comes back on the phone and she says, go ahead, ma'am, Grant is on the line. I got off that couch and I just started pacing because I really didn't know what I was going to say. And here was Grant. Hi, Grant. This is Debbie. 
from the refund check thing? And he's like, oh yes ma'am, and what can I help you with? Um, no it's not about the check, Grant. Grant, when I got off the phone, I was supposed to pray for you, and so I did. And then God said to me that he wanted me to call you back, and you know, Grant, how the impossibility of me getting you again. And then it was here at this time that God just spoke exactly what I was supposed to do and say, I don't know if you know God, but he knows you. And he wanted you to know right now how very much he loves you. And it was quiet. And then Grant said, you just confirmed something for me. Thank you. I hung up, but I actually went into my bedroom and I got on my knees. And all I could do was pray one thing, bring him back home. Bring him back home, Jesus. Bring him back home. And I had this sense that someone has been praying for Grant and that he had maybe known the Lord and known that relationship, but he walked away. And someone was praying that he'd come back to Jesus, come back home. You know, I have so many stories like that. He loves you for who you are and not for what you should be. One of my favorite scripture verses is Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is living among you. Notice that it says, is living presently right now with us. He takes delight in you with gladness. I just can't tell you how joyful it is for me to share God's moving in his word in my life and letting me share those stories with women. And that's the number one thing I hear, that I'm so much like you, I am so much like someone somebody knows, and that they want more stories. More stories of how God's Word was applicable to an everyday life situation, an everyday matter. Nothing is wasted with God. Nothing. There's always a blessing. There's always a lesson. I think what was so helpful for me to realize was that just because I had freedom in Jesus didn't mean that I had freedom from problems. That there was going to be hard stuff, but there was going to be peace available to me through a relationship with Jesus, not through a religion, not in trusting and following other people, but in following God himself, there would be hope. And the hope that we can share with others is by serving and coming alongside of others in love, in freedom. That's ministry. He is good. He is better. God is better than anything that we could ever look to, any person, any occupation, any title. He is good all the time. God is good. <laughs>